and welcome. I'm Chris Cowdley on behalf of CME Outfitters. I would like to welcome and thank you for joining us for today's educational activity titled At-Risk Patients Hidden in Plain Sight, Real-World Strategies for Screening and Treating Hepatitis B Virus. Today's activity is brought to you by CME Outfitters, an award-winning accredited provider of continuing education for clinicians worldwide. Again, uh, my name is Chris Cowdley. I'm the director of Liver Institute Northwest and clinical professor at Elson Els Els Floyd College of Medicine at Washington State University. I would like to welcome our panel joining me today. First, let me introduce Joseph Ahn. Joseph is a professor of medicine and section chief in the division of gastroenterology and hepatology, as well as director of clinical hepatology at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland. Joseph is a hepatologist, with a long-standing interest in research, teaching, care, and education, and advocacy in hepatitis B. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Hi. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, all of you for joining us, and I look forward to learning together. Next, let me introduce Amy Shantang. Amy is the Director of Immigrant Health at Northeast Medical Services in San Francisco, California. Amy is also a primary care physician, and will be bringing that very important perspective to our program today and I look forward to her insight. And Amy has a very busy clinical practice with a large number of patients with chronic hepatitis B, and we really welcome her comments. Welcome, Amy. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight, and thank you, everyone, for joining remotely under these circumstances. I hope you get a lot of out, of, out of our discussion today. Let's start with our first augmented reality video that will specifically look at hepatitis B and mechanisms involved with hepatitis B infection and why early effective treatment, if vaccination is not effective or completed, is so essential. So let's go to the augmented reality tour now. Let's start with a look specifically at hepatitis B virus and the mechanisms involved with hepatitis B viral infection in the liver and why early effective treatment is so essential. Hepatitis B invades the liver cell and uses the cell itself to replicate by using the cellular machinery within the, within the hepatocyte. This occurs after the virus is bound to the hepatocyte via the viral surface antigen. And the cell then engulfs the virus, which is how the virus gains entry into the liver. Then an immune response is triggered and Cytotoxic T cells and other types of immune cells, such as natural killer cells, attack those infected hepatocytes, leading to hepatocyte injury and death, ultimately causing progressive damage to the liver. Let me start with our first learning objective, which is to implement routine screening protocols for hepatitis B virus in primary care settings and utilize these results to drive guideline-directed care. I would like to ask you, our audience, to get involved here. Amy, what do you think about the poll results? Can you give us some more detail on the overall burden that hepatitis B imposes and the opportunities that we as clinicians have relative to management? Yeah, so these results are very interesting to me. Um, so, so the correct answer to this question is actually one in three. So only a third of patients with chronic hepatitis B are aware of their diagnosis. It looks like a lot of um, audience members um, said one in 10. And so that statistic, we do hear about one in 10 Asians um, are infected with chronic hepatitis B. However, this question is about those who are aware. So um, fortunately, it is not one in 10, and it's a third of people are aware. But that still means that the majority of persons with chronic infection are unaware of their status. Um, one of the reasons for this is that chronic Hep B is often an asymptomatic condition, and many at-risk individuals are just simply never screened for it uh, due to a myriad of factors like limited access or utiliz utilization of preventative care or a lack of provider knowledge to screen for hepatitis B. An estimated uh, 292 persons, um, which is about 4% of the global population, are chronically infected with hepatitis B, uh, most from Africa or Asia. Um, about two in every three persons, as we mentioned, are unaware of their infection, but about 25% of those with chronic infection without monitoring or treatment will die prematurely of hepatocellular carcinoma, cirrhosis, or liver failure. So that's exactly why we're here today to learn about screening and treatment. Further, 
um, only about 10 to 15 percent of treatment candidates are actually on medicine. So there are a lot of people out there who need to be identified and, and treated. And lastly, Hep B is a vaccine preventable infectious disease, and only about a quarter of those adults are fully immunized. So as primary care uh, clinicians or frontline providers out there, um, some of the key tools that we have are to screen, vaccinate, and monitor persons who are at increased risk for hepatitis B. So number one, um, screening and vaccination is already part of our routine preventative care. Number two, um, it's very simple to monitor for hepatitis B. If you really break it down to the basics, it's just a matter of checking their viral load and um, ALT every six months. And then also, as part of routine cancer screening, we should be integrating liver cancer screening with ultrasound every six months for those who are identified as higher risk, which we'll talk about later in this presentation. Thank you. That was very clear and very practical. Uh, you mentioned screening for hepatitis B as an area in which we can improve. Uh, what does the evidence suggest about disparities in hepatitis B infection and immunity and what that can, how that can inform our care of patients? So in the U.S., the majority of persons diagnosed with chronic hepatitis B are foreign-born from either Asia or Africa. And the, the data um, that we're presenting on this slide is actually from a community health center in New York City that implemented universal hepatitis B screening because it had a largely Asian American patient population. They found very striking numbers that really reflect the high burden in the Asian community. Um, they found that more than half of their general adult population had been infected with hepatitis B in their lifetime, and approxim approximately 13%, or one in eight individuals, had chronic infection. Um, if you compare this to household contacts of persons with chronic hepatitis B, the number goes up to 22%, or about one in five. Additionally, there is also a big disparity in um, current and ever infection for those who uh, spoke English as their primary language versus Mandarin. So that was 17 versus 60%, and then four versus 16% for um, chronic infection. Clearly screening is critical. Let's ask the audience a question about screening. So Amy, let's talk now about how to screen for hepatitis B and current recommendations. Okay. Um, so in 2017, the American College of Physicians and uh, the CDC published their recommendation in annals to screen for hepatitis B with three serology tests. So not just the surface antigen and surface antibody that was previously recommended, but with three. So that includes the total core antibody, not IgM, but core. Um, so interpreting the results can be a little bit confusing, but I really want to just break, the, break down the reasons why we order these three tests. So the surface antigen tells us whether a person has current infection. The antibody, the surface antibody, tells us if they have immunity or immune control. And then the total uh, core antibody tells us if they've ever been infected in their lifetime. So they could be currently infected or it could be a result or a a prior infection. Um, so this, this figure that you see in front of you, uh, many of you have probably seen before, but it, it really diagrams um, acute and recovered infection. Um, it, it also illustrates the importance of using total uh, core Ig uh, uh, core, total um, core antibody to screen for history of hepatitis B infection in asymptomatic individuals rather than using IgM, which will actually disappear approximately six months after exposure. Um, so the next slide um, will show you the CDC and ACP recommendations for who should be screened for hepatitis B. You can see that it prioritizes persons based on their transmission risk factors and the risk for liver complications. This includes uh, persons born in countries with greater than 2% hepatitis B prevalence, pregnant women, and the infants born to Hep B infected mothers who are all at risk for vertical transmission. In addition to uh, sexual transmission risk factors, so um, men who have sex with men, sexual contacts of persons with hepatitis B, and then also blood transmission risk factors such as those who, in, uh, persons who inject drugs, blood and tissue donors, persons um, with end-stage renal disease, and then lastly, uh, the category of those who are at risk for hepatitis reactivation or liver complications, including those on immunosuppressive therapy, 
um, persons who are getting treated for hepatitis C or simply have hep C, um, and persons with HIV, and also people who are undergoing a workup for elevated ALT. Um, and then one other point I just want to make is that hepatitis C is highly infectious, 100 times more infectious than HIV, and can last on surfaces as dried blood for more than seven days. So this blood to blood transmission issue is, is really an important one. Excellent, thank you so much. The patient's results come back. Uh, he's surface antigen negative, surface antibody positive, and has antibody to total core. So how do you explain these results? Joseph, do you have anything uh, to add about how you teach medical students, uh, internists, fellows, uh, and colleagues about uh, pearls in terms of serology interpretation? Yeah, yes, Chris. I think that as we get to our next slide, it's important for us to remember, as Amy showed us, what these three tests mean. That hep B surface antigen is a marker of current infection, that the hep B surface antibody is a marker of immunity, and finally, the most difficult one is the hepatitis B core antibody. This is a marker of prior infection or exposure. And we need to, we're going over this actually in two slides because of how hard it is to remember. And one of the teaching pearls is that in some ways, some data like this, you, you have to memorize. So let's go through what some scenarios. So the top line, if you have a positive surface antigen, that means that you are currently infected. That's why the surface antibody is negative because you have not developed protective immunity. And the core antibody is positive, denoting that you, you were exposed before. The second row is those who are susceptible, that is, they don't have an infection, they weren't exposed, and they do not have a protective antibody. You want to convert them to those who are immune from vaccination, as in the fourth row there, by giving them vaccination. Now, in the prior slide, we looked at those who have isolated hepatitis B core antibody with or without the surface antibody. And these are the patients who have been exposed. And if they are put on some form of significant immunosuppression, they may have reactivation of the hepatitis B. These are patients who have exposure and this can come back. And I think that's an important point for us to teach. We go back to the patient. So Joseph, what do you think about the answer? Well, I, I think that it shows that our audience is very smart, uh, that they're listening. We can clearly see that they've heard the message that Amy gave, that we are not just doing two tests for screening, that we want to do three tests, the surface antigen to detect current infection, the surface antibody for protective immunity, and finally, the core antibody to denote exposure or infection. So I think uh, the message is getting through. Great job. Amy, we know that screening is important, but vaccination plays a role in reducing the burden of hepatitis B as well. Uh, this is a really important topic. Talk to us about who should be vaccinated and the imp impact vaccination can have on morbidity and mortality. Okay, so th this this um, list may look very similar to what I presented to uh, for screening, and that's because it is. And so what I did is I actually highlighted in yellow um, some of the differences in the groups that should also receive vaccination. So it also includes for the vertical transmission category, what, uh, pregnant women who are at risk for hepatitis B infection. So you can vaccinate pregnant women um, with the three dose vaccine. Um, Heplosap is not currently um, approved for pregnant women. However, the, en the Endrix, uh, the three dose series is. Um, for sexual transmission as a risk factor, um, the additional categories of those who receive, uh, who should be vaccinated are those who are not in a mutually monogamous relationship or persons who are simply seeking evaluation or treatment for, S for uh, sexually transmitted infections. Under the category of blood to blood transmission, we also include residents and staff of facilities for uh, developmentally disabled persons, uh, public safety workers, and of course, healthcare workers who are at risk for exposure to blood or blood contaminated fluids, and then adults age, uh, age younger than 60 with diabetes, which is a huge category. Um, and then uh, in addition for those who are at risk for liver complications, anyone who has chronic liver disease. So that includes 
uh, patients with chronic hepatitis C, those with fatty liver, cirrhosis um, from any etiology should all be vaccinated for hepatitis B. That was great. Uh, so we have covered the importance of screening, uh, testing, and vaccination, and have shown how it applies in an example with a particular patient. Uh, there are several questions coming in, uh, and they're all excellent questions, so I will make sure we have time to discuss them. Um, before we go on to the next learning objective, um, Joseph, could you, uh, actually Amy, could you once again uh, kind of go over the interpretation of a core antibody positive surface antigen and antibody negative patient? Okay, so the isolated core patient. Right. Sure. Right. Okay, so this is perhaps the most uh, confusing result because there are potentially four different ways to interpret it. I would say the most common, if you are screening someone from an endemic region um, for hepatitis B and they have isolated core positivity, is that they were simply previously infected with hepatitis B, but their immune system did not mount um, a sufficient antibody response to produce detectable an antibody. Um, so I would give them simply the counseling that you would to someone that has antibody positive is that they were previously infected with hepatitis B, the virus is dormant in their liver, they're at risk for reactivation of their hepatitis B if they uh, go on immunosuppressive medications in the future and that they should always inform their provider about this status. Now, the, the less, less common categories I'll just mention really quickly are those with occult hep B infection, which are those who actually have chronic hep B, but um, undetectable um, surface antigens. So if you actually check their hepatitis B DNA levels, it, there will be a low level amount of viremia. And usually you would only see this in patients who are immunosuppressed, on immunosuppressive medicines or HIV. So you don't need to check everyone for a DNA. There's also this very, very low likelihood of false positive core, um, really not common with today's modern assays. And then also very unlikely is the window period after an acute infection. Perfect. I think it was important to reemphasize that because there are several questions. So let's move on to learning objective number two, optimize efficacy and safety profile of current agents when initiating or switching treatments in patients with hepatitis B. So uh, we've covered the importance of screening, testing, and vaccination. Let's talk about treatment. So goals of care. Uh, Joseph, what are our goals of care in hepatitis B management? Well, I think when patients come to us, uh, they're interested in uh, one major thing. They want to make sure they don't die from hepatitis B. So our goals of care are to help people live the longest they can, the fullest life they can. That's a big overarching goal. However, underneath that, because we don't follow patients for their entire life, underneath that we have some secondary goals because we know that hepatitis B is a leading cause of cirrhosis as well as liver cancer and that these lead to uh, morbidity and mortality. These are goals for us to prevent cirrhosis, to prevent liver cancer and then indirectly by doing so the need for liver transplantation. But because these markers also are medium to longer term uh, goals, when we take care of the individual patient in front of us, we have more short term immediate goals that we can relay to our patients. These are surrogate markers that help us know that we are on our way to meeting the goals of decreased complications and decreased long term mortality and morbidity. And these are the four things that you can see on the screen there. These are our markers that tell us that we are controlling the virus. ALT, which is a marker of liver injury or inflammation, Hepatitis B DNA, this tells us if we are able to control with the aid of antivirals, the replication or reproduction of hepatitis B. And then the E antigen and surface antigen loss are a little bit more difficult to understand, but they are markers that tell us that the immune system with the help of antivirals has been able to suppress the replication of the hepatitis B virus. So we should think about it overarching goals of improving life and length of life, decreasing cirrhosis and liver cancer, and underneath that, targeting and hitting these targets of decreased inflammation and decreased replication by having undetectable hep DNA and low and normal ALT. Well, that's perfect. And I think I would just want to take that and emphasize the point home by just saying that the goals of treatment with antiviral therapy and hepatitis B are to exactly accomplish 
the endpoints that we have here, but what we're hoping to accomplish, decrease the morbidity and mortality related to chronic hepatitis B. And we do that with therapy by achieving sustained remission and suppression of hepatitis B viral replication, reduce the progression to cirrhosis and liver-related complications, including cancer, and improving long-term survival. So those are our goals with antiviral therapy. So we've talked about goals of treatment, um, and certainly a very important goal is to focus on reducing the risk of progression to cirrhosis and attenuating progressive fibrosis. Um, and fibrosis progression, of course, is a stepwise process that goes from one stage to another. Let's look at the next augmented reality video showing the five stages of fibrosis. So you have uh, initially a liver that has no scarring and no fibrosis, which we would describe as F0. F1 scarring is minimal scarring where there's the initial response to injury. And over time, as scarring has progressed, it extends from one liver, liver lobule to the next with more significant fibrosis. And then we start to get into more dangerous levels of fibrosis called bridging fibrosis, where the fibrosis forms bridges from one lobule to the next. And this eventually leads to cirrhosis or more advanced scarring. And this, of course, is a stage at which we have the increased risk of liver cancer and risk of decompensation. So audience, I want to bring you in again. Joseph, what factors should guide a clinician's decision to initiate treatment for hepatitis B? Yeah, I think this figure gives us uh, one way to look at that. On the x-axis is time in years. And on the y-axis, we have multiple tests that we send. If you look at uh, three things, first is to note the hep B DNA, which is in green. The higher that is, it has been shown in research studies that this is associated with a higher risk of cirrhosis and liver cancer. So one of our goals is to suppress the hep B DNA. Now, this is great if your own immune system is able to do that, but oftentimes as patients age, the fight between the immune system and the hepatitis B leads the hep B DNA to still be persistently positive. So one of our goals will be to reduce hep B DNA preferably to undetectable levels. That is why in the next slide, we'll go over some of the targets or thresholds to consider antiviral therapy, that is 2,000 or 20,000. But those numbers are not as important as the concept that the higher the hep B DNA, the greater the risk of progression to scarring or fibrosis, as Chris, you've shown, and therefore an impact on morbidity and mortality. The second factor is in blue and the ALT. And the ALT is a marker of liver injury or liver turnover. And as you can see, when the body's ALT goes up as a result of your body trying to clear the hep B from the inf infected hepatocytes, this is what leads to ongoing scarring. Liver cells die, ALT goes up, and this is replaced by fibrosis or scar tissue. So we want to suppress the ALT. That is, we want to reduce the inflammation that's going on. So that's the second factor. We want to normalize ALT. And finally, it's, is that if patients have already developed some form of fibrosis, or colloquially speaking, scarring of the liver, we want to halt or reduce progression of that because this is what leads to earlier death as well as risk for liver cancer. At the final top, in the E antigen and E antibody, these are markers for showing whether or not the patient has active wild type disease or has had some success against developing antibodies to protect against hep B. Either way, the key three points are you want to have the lowest hep B DNA possible, normalize the ALT, and you want to prevent progression of fibrosis. And if fibrosis has occurred already, you want to prevent that person from having more that goes on to liver failure and end stage liver disease. Well, that's great. And um, I would like to bring Amy back in to provide a primary care physician's perspective on whether there are any other factors you consider in deciding to start treatment. Um, so other factors, I, I would want to make sure that the patient is on board with taking a medicine for the long term, because, of course, one of the biggest risks of taking these medicines is actually stopping it on their own and being at risk for post-treatment flare. 
Um, so I want to make sure that they really understand the importance of uh, medication adherence and working with their provider in managing their condition. Um, that it's not just something like an antibiotic that they take temporarily and it resolves their condition. Um, and I also want to make sure they have good access to their medicines, that it's affordable to them, that it's easy for them to obtain, that there aren't um, too many barriers to care. Um, and fortunately, um, there are a lot of tools that I, I have discovered over the years of um, ways to obtain affordable medicines for either patients who don't have insurance or those who um, have very high deductible copay plans. Thanks for that perspective. So uh, now let's re revisit the question on, we asked earlier about the ASLD guidelines. Great, thank you. So, uh, Joseph, what do you think? Well, I think this speaks to the complexity of guidelines and practice guidelines are just that. That they give us a minimum threshold to better understand what's the optimal treatment uh, practice in a situation. And just to bring everybody on board, I, I want to just go over what ASLD means. It's the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease. And this is just a group of the largest group of uh, liver and GI doctors that specialize in the liver. And based on expert opinion, as well as research studies, they've come up with some of these guidelines to say what number you should treat and the ALT and DNA. But we'll hear from Amy a couple of slides later that helps simplify this idea. But I think this uh, the audience was already sophisticated to begin with. And I think we should recognize the key points here, which is you want to target those with abnormal ALT and those who have elevated DNA. And I think the audience has captured that point very well with this result. Yeah, and I'm pleased to see that the number that said don't know has dropped significantly. Yes. Uh, Amy, anything from a primary care perspective with regard to um, testing and interpretation of results? Sure. Um, I guess I would want to comment that for those who work in low resource settings, the most important thing to be monitoring is actually their ALT. So if you have a patient um, who, you know, let's say they're uninsured and um, they have to pay out of pocket for the for their labs. And sometimes the HEPI DNA test can be can, is you know not the cheapest test. You could just monitor their ALT um, at you know every three to six months. Um, and when you see an elevation, then order the other test because um, in almost all uh, situations, an elevated ALT is something that needs to be investigated further and could uh, be a potential reason for referral or for or treatment. Well, that's great. So now that we know the parameters that guide treatment initiation, audience, I would like for you to please rate your level of familiarity with the current th therapies that the AASLD guidelines recommend. Certainly, uh, we have so many different guidelines, and some of these need to be interpreted for um, more of a primary care practice. And I think, as you said, uh, Amy, the DNA, the ALT uh, are the most important. The E antigen may be a little bit less. Okay, here are the results. So, um, Joseph, can you comment on these findings? Yeah, and I think that uh, the results show us that there is some familiarity, but not a great depth of familiarity, and that's not surprising. Uh, it would be akin to asking a, a hepatologist what the latest cardiovascular hypertensive medication lists uh, are. That being said, all of us, I think, should be familiar given the great magnitude and the burden of HEPI in the, in the United States uh, and largely in the world. And we'll go over this a little bit further to help our audience uh, remember and learn what the latest treatment options are according to the guidelines. Yeah, I think that's, that's great. This makes me feel actually like this exercise uh, is a valuable one, uh, and I'm very confident that by the end of this, this meeting, we will have uh, much more people familiar. So um, now in terms of initial treatment, uh, the ASLD guidelines, Joseph, can you now go over that? Yeah, so we, we should emphasize that uh, all of us, let's look at the top two uh, lines of this. The first treatment, it says ETV, that stands for entecavir. And both entecavir and the second row called tenofovir are the treatment drugs of choice by multiple societies uh, in the United States and worldwide. 
These are very similar and we'll go through some potential differences, but they are recommended because they're very potent. They work, they're very effective. And more, more importantly, and just as importantly, they have a low risk for patients to develop resistance so that it, the medicines continue to work. The caveat to that, as Amy has already said, is we don't want patients to start and stop. This is not like a short-term antibiotic. I explained this as something like hypertensive treatment or diabetes management. This is long-term, often lifelong. Secondly, the differences between antecavir and tenofovir are that uh, those patients who have had prior exposure to an older drug called lamivudine uh, should not be placed on patients uh, with antecavir. And the final point about the tenofovir is that there are two forms. There's an older drug called tenofovir disoproxyl. We will refer to that as TDF. And a newer version called tenofovir alafenamide, we will refer to that as TAF. And there are some differences we'll get into. But these three medications are the preferred recommended medications according to the National Society guidelines. One final point is that treatment, although it is associated with reduction in the risk of cirrhosis progression and liver cancer, does not eliminate the risk of liver cancer. And therefore, it's important both on a specialist as well as a primary care standpoint to remember to continue surveillance for liver cancer. Joseph, very clearly and beautifully summarized. Thank you. Um, so Amy, switching back to you, um, can you specifically talk about the management algorithm for primary care clinicians? And in particular, we want to really pivot uh, and encourage uh, PCPs to not just uh, identify and refer, but to feel confident with uh, starting therapy and knowing how to monitor patients on therapy, because I think this is something that any capable primary care physician could and should do. Do you agree? That's right. Yes, yeah. I agree. So, so as a primary care uh, phys physician myself, like I, I take pride when I can really manage as much as I can for the patient to really make things convenient that they don't have to see multiple providers to manage all their conditions. Um, however, um, I also heavily rely on simple algorithmic formulas to make quick decisions because I'm often managing multiple conditions in one visit. Um, so that was the main impetus for us, uh, a work group that um, I developed a couple of years ago that included um, hepatologists, infectious disease doctors, primary care pharmacy, as well as public health um, persons who um, came together and decided to develop a simplified algorithm for uh, PCPs to manage chronic hep hepatitis B. So the slide that you see in front of you is just the overall sort of framework of how we want uh, providers to move from initial screening to uh, managing those who are positive for the surface antigen versus negative for surface antigen. So along the lines of uh, management and treatment that we're discussing now, um, if the patient is pregnant, we actually did provide a simplified algorithm for managing pregnant women for internists or family docs. And then we also have a separate category for uh, treatment candidates. We talk about the preferred antivirals and also a simplified um, monitoring algorithm, which I'll actually show on the next slide. So the, ne the next slide shows, you know, in the top row, for those who have cirrhosis, they should all be placed on treatment regardless of their DNA or ALT level. If they have cirrhosis, they should be, on, and hepatitis B, they should be on antiviral. Um, and there's other things that go along with that, like liver cancer surveillance, um, you know, continued monitoring of their labs. And then, of course, if they have any signs of decompensated cirrhosis, they should definitely be promptly uh, referred to a hepatologist. Now, the, the, the bottom rows that you see highlighted in yellow are those who do not have cirrhosis. And um, instead of relying initially on their E antigen status, which I think can really confuse a lot of frontline providers, we actually go directly to looking at um, their DNA levels. And so we actually decided to just use the cutoff of 2000 instead of 2000 versus 20,000. Because most people who are antigen positive, who are in the infectivity replication state, will have a very high viral load. And so um, the combination of a high ALT and a high DNA level um, are those individuals that we said you should treat with antiviral 
monitor, continue to monitor them every six months with labs until they're undetectable and continue to make sure that it remains undetectable. And then that those who are candidates for liver cancer screening should, should get that. The other categories of you know, those who have high ALT but a low um, viral load should be investigated for other causes of that. And then you know, really the best case scenario are those who have both a low ALT and a low DNA. However, we shouldn't provide false reassurance for patients that just a one-time value of low numbers means that they're going to be fine for the rest of the life because hepatitis B is a very dynamic condition and it can change. And so those individuals should also be monitored every six months with at least the ALT and DNA levels. Yeah, excellent. I think the importance of monitoring patients at intervals no less often than every six months with ALT, DNA, and then cancer surveillance, which we'll get to, uh, is the take home message. So Joseph, there's been a lot of uh, interesting uh, recent research. Um, uh, we, I think, have finally gotten very good large data sets showing that treatment with antiviral therapy reduces the risk of, risk of hepatocellular carcinoma, not only in patients with cirrhosis, but maybe even in patients without. And there's some uh, intriguing data suggesting that the particular antiviral drug chosen may actually have an impact on cancer. And there's a couple of studies that I thought maybe you could take us through uh, fairly quickly. Yes, yeah, thank you. So I, I wanna concur with what Amy just said, that I think we as providers tend to undertreat patients with hepatitis B. So I would uh, second uh, the role of primary care physicians and the importance of collaboration and multidisciplinary care of patients with chronic hepatitis B, that if it is unsure, either err on the side of referring them, or if they have elevated ALT and DNA, as Amy has nicely gone over, treat them and follow them. Now, in this study, before we get into it, I want to make a brief comment that there is, it's, it is more and more clear that antiviral therapy can reduce the risk of liver cancer and cirrhosis. So that's the background into that. Once we've established that, research has now been turning to see is, is there a difference between the currently available antiviral medications, in this case, TDF or tenofovir versus ETV or entecavir. On the x-axis, this is a large data set of nearly 30,000 patients, and patients were followed for more than five years. On the y-axis, this is a predictive incidence. That is, how many new patients develop liver cancer? The graph on the left is just something called propensity weighting. That is, the study researchers compared these two groups of tenofovir and tecavir and matched them to the risk factors that lead to liver cancer. So they're trying to account for the liver cancer risk so that these patients are similar. And this intriguing study suggests that perhaps that entecavir versus tenofovir, that there's a slightly lower risk with tenofovir for developing liver cancer. The right-hand graph is something where they matched five patients with entecavir to one patient with tenofovir, and they saw something very similar. That is, it appears that there may be a lower risk of tenofovir for patients to develop liver cancer. That being said, I think the main messaging is that antiviral therapy is better than no antiviral therapy in this regard. And secondly, I do want to point out some limitations. Although this is a large data set, we see this graph diverging at about one year, suggesting that this difference may be due to the patient pools who are placed on entecavir versus tenofovir. So more data needs to be sought, but this is very intriguing data that there may be a difference in the favor of uh, and tenofovir. This is a, a contrasting study coming out from Korea. TDF or tenofovir versus ETV and entecavir. What they did is they followed a, another large group of patients with chronic hepatitis B. They looked at outcomes of liver cancer on the left-hand graph or death or liver transplant need on the right-hand graph. What you can see here is that in this recent study from Korea, that there was no difference between these two drugs. So again, I wanna point out, no drugs is not as good as having drugs on board. So antiviral therapy is beneficial, that there is some signal toward one of these drugs, tenofovir being a little better with risk uh, factors for liver cancer, but we need further more controlled studies before we can finally say that there's a clear difference. Great, excellent. Uh, I think well done. So back to the audience. So one of the new observations that we have is tenofovir alafenamide, which has been around for uh, treating HIV for quite some time, appears to have 
a better renal and bone safety profile. And so switching from TDF to TAF may be a good option, particularly for patients at higher risk for bone or renal uh, impairment. So, uh, Joseph, we talked about the efficacy of TDF versus entecavir, possibly superiority in cancer prevention. What do these la latest data suggest about the impact on bone and renal parameters in patients switching from TDF to TAF? Yeah, Chris, I think this is a, a, a new drug has come out, TAF, um, as you mentioned, more for new for the hepatitis B. There's uh, safety and efficacy data for HIV. But one of the takeaways to provide context for our audience is that studies have shown that TAF is similar or just as efficacious or superior to TDF in terms of suppressing the happy DNA, normalizing the ALT, but that it has some superiority with regards to safety with the renal and bone parameters. Now, this study has come out recently, and the key point that's new is whether or not patients who have been on tenofovir TDF for several many years may still have benefit. In this case, they looked at patients who had been less than four years or greater than four years, and they had nearly 250 patients. And what this is broken down into three subparts, that with renal bone parameters, even patients who had been on TDF for many years, for more than four years, still had benefit with regards to the bone and kidney parameters, just as much as those who had only been on tenofovir TDF for less than four years. I think the message here is that it's not too late to consider switching people for the potential added benefit of bone and kidney parameters. The third part, the lipid parameters, there was no difference. The, just for everybody to be on the same page with TAF, we do not need to do any dose adjustment for patients with chronic kidney disease uh, as long as they're not on hemodialysis. If they're on hemodialysis, they're dosed following the hemodialysis session, typically three times a week. Now, this study showed that those who have severe renal impairment and those who are on end-stage renal disease, these medications work. So both uh, TDF and TAF work. You can look at the happy DNA suppression and the ALT suppression. However, when you switch patients from TDF to TAF, patients still have an improvement in the bone parameters. And as long as patients have not progressed to requiring hemodialysis, you can see on the last row that the kidney parameters do improve. So I think this again shows that it's perhaps never too late to consider switching those patients who are on TDF to TAF in the setting of trying to benefit in the kidney and bone parameters. Thanks, Joseph. Amy, uh, as a busy uh, primary care provider, uh, do you think that these data will influence kind of how you think about it in terms of your patient population? Um, well, I do. I do know that uh, TAP is uh, definitely safer for uh, kidney and bone compared to TDF. Um, but I do want to just make the point that you know ASLD really puts these three medicines that you've heard in Tecavir, TDF, TAF as all first-line preferred agents. Um, and I think about it really in terms of one, is the patient pregnant? If she's pregnant, she should be on TDF because that's really the, the, the medicine with the best safety profile. The other medicines are not as studied as well for, or as, are not deemed as safe for that specific population. And I also apply that to women of childbearing age who, who may become pregnant in the next few years. I would, I would put them on TDF because it's the safest if they do become pregnant. And then the other factors I think about are, uh, does the patient have chronic kidney disease? Are they at risk for renal issues? And then in that case, I think about Entecavir or TAF as safer medicines for that population. Um, Entecavir, the main, the main reason that I, I avoid it for certain people is if they've been on hepatitis B medicines in the past, um, and specifically lamivudine, um, I do avoid it because there may be a resistant issue. But otherwise, if they've never been on hep B medicines before, it's a perfectly um, safe and effective medicine. Um, but it is great that um, TAF is now available because some of the concerns that we had in the past about TDF, um, you know, I do think it is better for kidney and bone. For those pregnant women, it can be a temporary treatment until um, they're done with childbearing and they could be switched, as we mentioned, at a later date. Great. So let's look at the ARS question we asked earlier. Which of the following is accurate relative to patients switching from TDF to TAF? 
Okay, so the correct answer is two. Uh, in renally impaired patients with chronic hepatitis B, bone and renal safety improved 24 weeks after switching. And um, I think we have a good, good outcome there. So uh, nicely done. Uh, so thank you. Uh, Joseph and Amy, we covered the treatment, why to treat, and how switching may improve after uh, improve other health outcomes, such as bone density and renal function uh, with uh, TAF. Let's move on to our third learning objective, which is about providing culturally appropriate counseling and support services to patients so that they can understand the disease and promote retention and care. And this is particularly because the um, importance of maintaining patients in care is critical to identifying liver cancer uh, sooner. So unlike hepatitis C, hepatitis B infection can cause liver cancer in patients without cirrhosis. Chronic hepatitis B increases the odds of liver cancer 50 to 100 times, uh, whereas hepatitis C is only 15 to 20 times. And viral hepatitis has driven the 38% increase in liver cancer in the U.S. between 2003 and 2012. And we know that chronic inflammation and necrosis are key factors predisposing patients to liver cancer. Let's look at our next augmented reality video, which focuses on the three primary mechanisms by which hepatitis B is thought to promote liver cancer. HPV proteins are involved in many signaling pathways and hepatocytes, thereby affecting the expression and functions specific genes and contributing to liver disorders. The virus integrates into the host genome and then alters the function of endogenous genes or induces chromosomal instability. So this is how you can have pro-oncogenes uh, pro or tumor suppressor genes being disrupted and cancer risk being increased. HPV-induced immune imbalance also leads to the development of a pedicellar carcinoma resulting in oncogenic transformation. Separate signaling pathways are also deregulated in HCC, and hepatitis B infection of hepatocytes is thought to impact a number of cellular signaling pathways to regulate expression and function of genes that control cellular processes and HPV replication and persistence, leading to oncogenic transformation. So those, that was a helpful video. I would like to bring in the audience again. Joseph, what do you think of the results? Well, I think this reflects real world practice. We often, even those we know we should screen and those we should screen to remind everyone are those with cirrhosis, Asian men over the age of 40, Asian women over the age of 50. These are our typical target audience. That number should be 100%. For those patients who do not have advanced fibrosis and do not fit into these ethnic guidelines, it should be 0%. But I think the reason there's such heterogeneity is that in real world practice, our real world uh, delivery of care is often suboptimal. And are there additional risk factors for cancer and appropriate methods for surveillance? And I think the audience uh, for the purposes can look at this, but what I wanna call out are things that are modifiable. Those who have alcohol use should be advised not to drink alcohol. This is the reason why we want to target elevated DNA, abnormal ALT, and as Amy mentioned, we want to look at those parameters to try to normalize or make the hep DNA undetectable. These other co-infections, hep C, HIV, and hepatitis delta, it's an important reminder for us to check for those uh, co-infections. And then finally, recognizing cirrhosis is the most important factor to identify those who need surveillance. Great. Uh, Joseph, what are the tools or methods we have for surveillance to use in our own practices? Yeah, you know, the ASLD guidelines and many other guidelines recommend that every six months you do a liver ultrasound. This can be with or without the serum alpha fetoprotein, although most hepatologists do obtain the alpha fetoprotein. You do not need a diagnosis of liver cancer by biopsy. Liver cancer diagnosis can be made by MRI or CT scan, which you should order if there's an abnormal ultrasound. What does the evidence suggest about the impact of monitoring? Yeah, and I think this is a, the most recent study of a large number of patients from Asia. And what that is, is separate into those who had no follow-up, irregular follow-up, or regular follow-up. And what you can see here is that those patients who had regular follow-up were more likely to be able to get a curative treatment of any kind. 
and that those who had follow-up had a reduction in liver cancer death up to 44%. This is pretty obvious, but I think this type of data helps support the importance of regular follow-up and surveillance for liver cancer for those patients with chronic hepatitis B, especially for those who have cirrhosis. And, and this next uh, uh, part here shows us a little breakdown. And for the purposes of time, I'm not going to go into it in complete depth. But what I want to point out is that among those patients with chronic hepatitis B, of course, cirrhosis was associated with a higher risk of liver cancer. That's the middle two columns there under cirrhosis. But even among those without cirrhosis, and in this Korean population, those patients without cirrhosis were at risk, men over the age of 40, women over the age of 50. And what regular surveillance did was able to diagnose these patients earlier, and by earlier diagnosis, connect them to curative treatment and overall improvement in survival. Great. Amy, can you uh, give us some high-level tips for primary care providers? Uh, well, it's so important to provide uh, good counseling education to patients who have chronic hepatitis B. And I think one of the most important things is to tell them it's a chronic condition, you know, much like diabetes and hypertension. So they need to have routine follow-up care at least every six months so they can monitor for disease progression. Um, we, they also need to be educated and counseled on the long-term implications of chronic hep B, like why it's so important that they're in care, you know, to prevent the complications that Joseph had mentioned, like cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. And then also to inform all of their other providers and future providers about their hep B status. Um, so if they're ever placed on medic medicines that will modulate or affect their immune system, that their provider can recognize a potential risk for hep B reactivation. Um, and of course, as Joseph mentioned, there are modifiable risk factors to prevent hep B complications, like avoiding or limiting alcohol use, optimizing their body weight to address metabolic syndrome, things like diabetes, uh, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, and then also counsel them on how to prevent transmission to others. So um, cleaning up blood spills with bleach, um, having their household contacts be uh, tested for hepatitis B and making sure they're vaccinated if they're susceptible. That's great. I think uh, the idea of using bleach to clean surfaces is certainly well established at the present time. Uh, yeah. What about <laughs> referral to a specialist? I think we want to encourage the PCP to uh, feel empowered to screen, diagnose, and treat. Um, when, when should you refer to a specialist? <laughs> Um, so I, I would say uh, hopefully all PCPs are already recognized that it's really their responsibility to be screening for Hep B and also vaccinating individuals who are susceptible and indicated. Um, and I hope that from this session that the providers who are participating feel comfortable with evaluating, counseling, monitoring um, patients who are, are treatment candidates. You know, so we talk about again and again about every six months doing those uh, labs for hepatitis B viral load and ALT and getting uh, liver cancer screening ultrasounds and, you know, telling the patients this is a dynamic disease, they need to stay engaged in care. However, once you get an ultrasound that's abnormal and shows a potential liver cancer lesion, um, sometimes uh, your radiologist may use LIRAD scoring, scoring system. So LIRAD three, if it's ultrasound or five, four or five, if it's CT or MRI, that's definitely an indication to refer immediately to um, a hepatologist or a liver cancer clinic um, for further evaluation. And then any of my patients that have cirrhosis and particularly um, symptoms of decompensated cirrhosis should also be referred to specialists because they will need routine upper endoscopies and monitoring for decompensation. That's great. So uh, Amy, we saw earlier there are cultural disparities in HPV screening. Can you talk to us about the need for culturally appropriate counseling and how clinicians can make it a part of routine care? And the question that just came in, I wanna to add to this, how do you overcome the stigma that some cultures experience relative to hepatitis B when trying to screen at-risk patients? Sure. Um, so the, this graphic that we have here is really just highlighting the, really the two, the two largest groups affected by hepatitis B in the US. So, so persons born in the continents of Africa and Asia. And I don't want to um, overgeneralize some of the cultural 
um, beliefs around hepatitis C for these two very large populations. And even within Asia and Africa, there are so many, um, you know, subcultures. And, and, and a lot of this, a lot of this is also dependent on the patient's educational status and things like that. So, um, but when I was in New York City and a primary care doctor at um, a federally qualified health center there, I did take care of both um, what mainly West African patients in New York City, as well as um, largely Chinese, Vietnamese patients. And I did find that there were a lot of key differences. I found that stigma um, often correlated with how common um, a disease was in that population, how well it was recognized. Uh, I found that in my Chinese patients, um, they just said, oh, well, you know, everyone has hep B. And it was almost normalized to the point that they felt they didn't need to in actively engage in care, that it was just something that a lot of people had. Whereas some of the African patients that I um, took care of were, you know, just as um, afraid of the stigma of hep B as they were of HIV and didn't want to tell their family members or their partners and were afraid of the repercussions of that. And so we have to be really sensitive um, you know, when we're talking about household contact screening, um, when we're talking about transmission, making sure they understand how it is transmitted. Um, one common belief is that um, hep B can be spread through sharing food and utensils, and, and that's definitely not true, or hugging and kissing. So when you talk about how it's, you know, mainly transmitted through blood, um, sex, and childbirth, and um, how we can prevent those types of um, transmission risk factors from, from actually affecting their loved ones. Um, so the next slide is really um, listing some of the common um, cultural considerations when we're managing these patients. So language barriers is a big one. You know, a lot of these patients in the U.S. with chronic Hep B are foreign-born and prefer um, a language other than English as their primary language. So um, fortunately, where where I work, I I can often speak um, in the same language and dialect as the patients that I'm serving, and that's very helpful in establishing a trusting relationship. But if you're not, you know, in many situations, that's not the case. So using interpreters um, and, uh, and also, uh, you know, talking, addressing stigma, um, addressing um, potentially lack, in, uh, lack of trust in healthcare systems or providers, these are things we need to really discuss up front to prevent um, patients from being lost to follow up. Thank you for those useful insights and really good uh, suggestions. Um, there are a few issues that are very current, uh, management considerations for hepatitis B in the COVID-19 era. So as many of you are aware, telehealth has been accommodated with emergency funding legislation, allowing patients to actually get the visit at home and allowing uh, providers to be able to um, to be able to provide the service from a location that is not their office. <clears throat> we can use Zoom, we can use um, uh, FaceTime, uh, and billing, at least with uh, federal insurance and many commercial insurance, is at the same level for, um, <clears throat> for patient care as it is for uh, in-office in visits. So, um, so I think I would encourage every one of you to make sure that you have an opportunity to uh, learn about telemedicine and incorporate it into your practice, just to make sure these patients are kept in care. Uh, ASLD has some recommendations about considering phone visits or telehealth visits, considering patient education, and maximize in-person visits only for patients who are uh, in greatest need, such as pre-transplant, et cetera. SMART goals are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, timely goals. And these are culturally sensitive strategies that would allow us to improve the detection and management of hepatitis B. It's important to screen all of our patients at risk for hepatitis B using the appropriate tests, surface antigen, surface antibody, core antibody, and if appropriate, HPV DNA. Use recent clinical trial data, and you've seen some very recent data to drive safe, effective treatment selection, and all patients who are appropriate for monitoring should be monitored for HCC. So we are ready uh, to answer questions. We have a great deal of questions here, and I hope we will answer as many as possible in the time allotted. Um, as a reminder, you can submit your question in the Ask a Question tab or, be, or through Twitter. Um, so 
Uh, first was, uh, what resources are available to help me educate foreign-born patients with hepatitis B about their disease? Uh, so are there cultural or language appropriate uh, teaching materials and screening materials um, that Joseph Yu or Amy know of? I know that, uh, uh, that these are often available through the manufacturers of the different uh, therapies, but do you have any, uh, just a brief, uh, you know, a list of sources or ideas uh, for our questioner. Uh, so I can start out with uh, CDC. They have a no hepatitis B uh, campaign. Um, so that's no as in K-N-O-W, hepatitis B. And so they have a wide range of uh, materials that are available in set, like a dozen plus languages. Um, and and um, they really collaborate with HEPI United and HEPI Foundation, which are the other really big, large um, HEPI uh, organizations out there that are really there to organize community-based organizations and to provide health education materials for patients. So those are really the, the main sites. I would say no hepatitis B from the CDC and then um, HEPI Foundation. They also have a lot of materials. Great suggestions. And we will also have on our website educational tools in various languages to help patients better understand hepatitis B on this uh, CME Outfitters uh, website as well. So uh, that's a great, uh, great input. Um, so I have some other questions here. Um, uh, what about uh, TAF versus TDF during breastfeeding? Amy, do you want to tackle that one? Um, sure. I. You know, well, I guess I'll, I'll say that when I have a patient who is started on TDF during pregnancy for the purposes of reducing mother to child transmission, I actually counsel them that they can stop the antiviral at delivery. If the purpose of them starting the medicine at usually around 30 weeks of pregnancy was specifically to reduce mother to child transmission they can safely stop at delivery and continue monitoring with their hepatitis B provider. Um, so they actually don't need to be on the medicine during breastfeeding. There is an exception. There are some women who are placed on treatment because they have something called immune active hepatitis B, which, um, which uh, Joseph had mentioned, you know, those patients who have high ALT levels, they have liver inflammation, they need to be on it for the long term to prevent complications. Those women should be advised to continue their antiviral therapy even um, while they are breastfeeding. Um, and so because they were on TDF during pregnancy, I would just advise they continue that same medicine. And um, it, is, it is supposed to be safe during breastfeeding, like even though it is found um, in the milk, it, there are no studies that show that it's harmful to the baby. Um, so that is, that is what I say. I actually would invite uh, Joseph to to also give his recommendation. So I'll yeah, I, I would have. We have a we have a ahead, lot Jeff. of questions, so let's have one one or two quick snappy answers. Um, so okay. I'm going to take the program and go to the next question. Uh, Joseph, uh, there's a uh, a very important question here. What is the difference between TDF and TAF? And um, yeah. Uh, and, and it's one better than the other. I think we've talked about they're both equally efficacious in terms of viral suppression, but what are, uh, can you just summarize very quickly the key difference between the two drugs? Yeah, they're both uh, uh, the same prodrug. That is the final drug that is effective. The only difference is the chemical compound that attaches to this drug and how it's delivered. So TAF requires a smaller amount and more of it goes to where it needs to go, that is to the liver, thus lower risk. Perfect. So um, uh, we, uh, w there was a question about going over serology results one more time, but we did that in real time. Uh, this is a very practical question, and I want uh, just a one-word answer. Uh, if uh, a client received two series of the three-shot vaccine, non-responder after two series, would you give a third series with the two-shot Heplisave or Heplisav Hep B vaccine? Amy? Yes. Two times non-responder, do you vaccinate a third time? Yes, we actually did a trial at where I used to work and we saw a good response to people who had previously been non-responders to the three dose. Okay, and Joseph, you do the same? 
I would, my one word answer is depends. Okay. Depends on what? You, you ha I know I have to ask you, but two more <laughs> words. Uh, no, I, I think uh, Amy's uh, point is well taken. For most people, I think you can. However, there are some people who will not respond. And I think it's important to know whether they are at low risk or high risk. Definitely, if they have cirrhosis, if they have chronic liver disease, you should try again. Great. So there are several COVID-related questions, um, and um, none of us, uh, fortunately, uh, are practicing in very high uh, areas, uh, COVID areas, but, but you may have connections with New York. But there's a question of uh, what is the impact of, of uh, COVID-19 in a hepatitis B patient? Is there, Amy, do you have any, uh, any, any input on that, any, anything you've heard about it? Well, some of the things that, uh, that, so I am doing telehealth for my hep B patients now. And one thing that we have to consider is just making sure our patients have enough supply of their medications during this COVID crisis and that they don't run out and then stop because they ran out of their medicine. Um, so I, I, we've been trying to take the initiative to call these patients, make sure that they have enough of their medicine. You know, if their appointment was canceled, you know, their in-person appointment was canceled because of COVID that they are at least able to continue. And as things start to improve, conditions improve and are safer, we eventually want them to come in for their lab monitoring. It's, it's okay to delay it for a little bit, depending on their specific circumstances. And the same thing applies for liver cancer ultrasound surveillance. Um, but the important thing is that they're on treatment. We want to make sure they still have their medicine so we don't see a lot of people who have post-treatment flare from running out of meds. Great. Um, so... Joseph, is switching from TDF to TAF straightforward? How do yes. you do it? Yeah, I think you just, you don't need to have a taper. You give them a new prescription and have them make sure they are not taking both at the same time, but they can just transition right away. Okay. Um, a question about, is bone health an issue for our male patients? Amy, yeah, absolutely. Oh, go ahead, Amy. Pardon me. So you, you go ahead. You go ahead, Joseph. Yeah, go ahead. I, no, I think uh, bone health uh, of any kind, especially for patients with chronic liver disease who have advanced fibrosis, from a subspecialist standpoint, we need to recognize that even men with chronic liver disease, especially cirrhosis, can have osteoporosis and osteopenia. I defer back to Amy about the overall uh, bone health, but it is definitely something that we pay attention to in our specialty field. A question for Amy, what are the treatment considerations um, um, I think this may have been to be a typo here. I think you've mentioned it already for pregnant women who are surface antigen positive, surface antibody negative, and it says total core negative. So obviously that patient would not be total core negative unless the surface antigen is a false positive surface antigen. Um, how often do you run across this uh, false positive surface antigen during pregnancy? Um, I don't think I've really seen that before, but if you do get that scenario where the core antibody is negative, but surface antigen is positive, I would just check a DNA level to see if it's real. Yeah. And a teaching point there would be, of course, uh, that a patient that's surface antigen positive, that's a true surface antigen positive patient would almost always be core positive. Yeah. I mean, not, not almost always. They would always be core positive. Um, have any of the hepatitis B drugs been tested against COVID-19? Um, I don't know. No. Um, the uh, next question is, how can you tell if a patient has cirrhosis or not, by serology or ultrasound? Joseph? Yeah, I think this is a long question, but basically the gold standard is to do a liver biopsy. More recently, there are new uh, uh, efforts such as trans and elastography or fiber scan. This is something that should be available to your local radiologist or your GI referring providers. This is a way to measure stiffness. There are some blood tests and there are some simpler things such as an AST platelet ratio index, but all of these should be taken into a whole. In the primary care setting, you can start with blood tests to look for a lower platelet count. You can get an ultrasound to see if there are features of cirrhosis. And then I think a trans and elastography can be helpful, especially for those patients whom, in whom you have a higher suspicion. Older patients, abnormal ALT, high DNAs. Uh, and Great. Amy, do you want to say a word about Hep B online? Yeah. So 
Um, HEPB Online is a website uh, dedicated to HEPB management that was uh, actually created just two months ago or went live two months ago out of University of Washington. It was funded by the CDC. And so the, the guidance uh, for PCPs that I mentioned is posted on there. And they also have APRI and FIB4 uh, scoring calculators. So that's what Joseph had just mentioned about using uh, labs like AST and platelets to calculate their um, likelihood of having cirrhosis. So you can use that on HEPB online as well. The, uh... I think you mentioned this already. Uh, I'm going to ask Joseph, how do you counsel patients who are at risk for reactivation? Um, and what is the risk of reactivation in patients that are core antibody positive? I think the key takeaways are that there are degrees of reactivation risk. There's high, medium, and low. The highest ones that I think are most important for our audience are patients who get chemotherapy or rituximab. Uh, these antibody, uh, these these type of medications can cause a reactivation risk that's in uh, the double digits. However, patients who get low dose or short-term prednisone, steroid uh, uh, for asthma, these are low risk. And in the middle are things such as uh, TNF inhibitors that patients receive for their rheumatoid arthritis or for those patients with inflammatory bowel disease. There are guidelines on the ASLD as well as the AGA websites, but the key remembrance is to actually test for the hep core antibody before patients get chemotherapy. I think that's an important takeaway. And you don't necessarily worry about, um, you don't necessarily worry about the patient being surface antibody positive. Uh, you would treat them the same as a surface antibody negative patient. Yeah, that's a good point. I think there are some uh, discussions and um, uh, some people believe that the antibody is a little bit more protective. However, if you have strong immunosuppressive therapy along the high risk, as I mentioned with rituxan, as well as with the chemotherapies, the surface antibody does not prevent those patients completely from having a flare. So I do think that the core antibody by itself is enough to identify those patients at risk. Great. Amy, a uh, question here is, I'm a primary care physician and I've always referred patients. So if I do testing and want to treat in a male patient with metabolic risk factors, would you start with TAF? Um, in a male patient, I would probably choose either Entecavir or TAF. Um, I, I don't really actually have a preference for either. A lot of it actually depends on access because um, TAF is a newer medication and so often more expensive or not covered by the insurance company, whereas Entecavir has been around for decades. So um, sometimes treatment decisions are actually based on their insurance formulary. And the next question is, um, this is an interesting one. Um, uh, are there any, uh, requirements about um, proof of citizenship before you can start therapy. Uh, I, I'm not aware of that. Nope. Uh, I, think, I think even for the patient support programs and the compassion and the expanded access programs, I don't think that's a, that's a requirement, uh, at least to the best of my knowledge, but I'm sure that that information is available from the manufacturers who would be providing the medication. So, yeah, I can just comment actually about the patient yeah. assistance programs. Yeah. Um, that uh, so for Barraclude and um, and I guess Vemily, uh, that they do not ask about citizenship, but oftentimes they will ask uh, to have some proof of their um, income. And so if they don't file taxes, for instance then that they would need like a letter from their employer saying what their income is. And sometimes that can be a barrier to some patients because they would have to admit to their employer that they have a condition like hepatitis B. So um, those are some of the factors that might come into play, but they do not ask directly about um, citizenship. Great, okay. Uh, last question, um, Joseph, uh, and you have one minute. Uh, how often does the flare, the flare of hepatitis B occur during treatment for hepatitis C in a patient who is only positive for core antibody? Yeah, I think there are reports. Uh, that's a great point. Uh, recently, with the directly acting antiviral therapies, 
there was concerns about hepatitis B flares in Japan and actually throughout the world. And these, uh, uh, although these can be severe, they're very rare. That being said, one of the recommendations uh, has been to make sure we screen patients with chronic hepatitis C for hepatitis B, all three tests as we went over today. If you have a patient with core antibody positive, they are at risk of having a hep B reactivation. That being said, this is very, very unlikely to happen, but you should be monitoring those patients for jaundice or elevated LFTs, and if that happens, you can obtain a hep B DNA. Now, some recommendations are that you have to triage patients to test them uh, perpetually, but my practice has been we get a baseline screening. If they're positive, we discuss with them the possibility, but tell them that it's rare. And when we do check LFTs, we look for an ALT. It should go down with hep C therapy. And if it goes up, it's a clue for you to check hep B DNA. Less than Rich. a minute. Perfectly done. Uh, once again, I'm sorry to rush uh, this very knowledgeable faculty um, and, and uh, keep things moving along. And I'm uh, really sorry uh, on behalf of CME Outfitters and my co-moderators that we couldn't get to all of the questions. Um, and I want to um, uh, thank uh, Dr. Ahn, Dr. Tang for um, being outstanding panelists and for a great program. Also wanna thank CME Outfitters for their assistance in developing today's program in the augmented reality segments. They did an outstanding, outstanding job transitioning what was going to be a live meeting uh, at the ACP meeting to a very engaging online virtual learning event. Um, we um, also want to thank them because the, we presented some very new recent data, and in fact, we were making slides uh, well into the night and the morning. So we've got some feedback that the uh, that the recent data is very is very much appreciated. So. Uh, thank you, CME Outfitters. Um, thank you, everyone. And stay safe. Um, and um, thank you for providing the best care to your patients. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you.